and welcome to the Explaining History podcast. And the thing I want to talk about today is the uh, relationship between air power, Great Britain and Bulgaria during the Second World War, particularly with reference to Winston Churchill's policies towards Bulgaria. Now, it's um, an interesting and little explored area, and um, you might be wondering, with the conventional picture of the war that we had, quite what Britain had to do with Bulgaria. Um, I, I've been reading recently The Bombing War by Richard Overy, which is a, a brilliant, a brilliant kind of magisterial account of um, the... Uh, um, different challenges and policies that um, the uh, Axis powers and the Allied powers had during the war regarding uh, bombing, uh, which is a highly controversial and problematic area um, to to understand. Um, I think the way that uh, Richard Overy puts it in the book, he says that many of the debates have created as much heat as they have light, which is a, a, a nice way of, uh, of framing the controversy. Um, but he makes a point that uh, bombing was, if anything, a far more powerful political tool uh, during the war than it was a military one, and all sides viewed bombing within its political context, that it was a way of delivering a fairly non-subtle message to civilian populations about what to do about their governments if they wanted to survive or, or if they wanted um, a change of, um, of policy during the war. Air power seems to have divided um, combatant nations in the war um, down the middle, really, in um, how it would be employed. Um, Britain and America saw the purpose of bombing as as that of a kind of a long range strategic um, system of of warfare, um, that uh, four engined heavy bombers would be used in large numbers to bomb cities, uh, to um, uh, destroy strategic uh, means for uh, creating uh, a war industry, um, to destroy transportation networks, manufacturing um, and fuel and energy systems. Um, such as oil refineries, and this eventually, uh, in about 1941, switches to a more overtly political, uh, particularly on the part of Great Britain, political uh, method of uh, trying to wear down civilian morale, uh, so there would eventually be some kind of uh, ch- regime change in uh, in Germany. The uh, Germans, the Italians, the Soviets and the French all saw uh, the purpose of bombing as a battlefield battlefield technique, that what the um, bomber was there for was to support infantry. And so, as a result, German bombers and Soviet bombers are smaller. Um, They fly ahead um, of uh, the infantry and destroy key um, objectives, Um, They're used as ground attack aircraft, so imagine for example the Junkers Stuka Dive bomber um, that was used uh, as a terror weapon. The uh, reason it makes this howling noise as it dives towards the earth is because of a kind of a klaxon type system within the nose cone, Uh, so it's specifically designed to um, break the morale of troops on on the ground. Uh, Britain hasn't really got uh, an equivalent, though later on on in the war there are ground attack aircraft, uh, but these are mainly fighters um, that are uh, doubled up as as light bombers or uh, uh, rocket-firing aircraft, things such as the Typhoon, for example. Anyway... It's with some irony that the modern aerial bomb was a Bulgarian invention um, created by a a pilot called um, Simeon Petrov. And throughout the First World War, the history of aviation is uh, one of innovation um, and really learning what purposes 
um, the this new technology can be put towards and what problems um, that it can it can solve of which there are uh, many on the on the battlefield in the first world war but on the 14th of November 1943 the um, first wave of allied attacks on Sofia the capital of Bulgaria began with American B-25 Mitchell bombers and uh, P-38 Lightnings um, attacking uh, a marshalling yard in Sofia. The justification for this was really based around Churchill's views um, of the kind of the soft underbelly of Europe. Bulgaria is obviously one of the uh, the minor Axis powers and had decided to um, throw the lot in with Germany. Um, the politics surrounding that one are interesting, and we'll look at that a bit later on. But Churchill was insistent throughout the war, and I've talked about this a lot in previous podcasts, on this kind of Mediterranean and later Balkan strategy, believing that uh, a head-on clash with Germany um, should be put off for as long as possible, and that a um, it would be ultimately unsuccessful. And in this, I think the British are are right. America's insistence on a, um, a, a an all-out frontal attack on Germany, probably in France somewhere, early on in the war, in 1942, would have ended in disaster because the Americans were not ready and the British had not really f- sufficiently recovered from the disasters of, of Dunkirk. This Mediterranean and Balkan strategy was not popular with the American chiefs of staff, Roosevelt appears to have tolerated it up until a point, and sometimes he'll encourage Churchill, other times he holds back. Um, he has a quite a shifting relationship, particularly with Churchill's ambitions. Often you get the sense with Roosevelt that he is far more likely to um, base his um, decisions that are not favourable to Churchill after be talking to people like Admiral King, um, or talking to George Marshall, these kinds of figures who are, in King's case, real Anglophobes, and in, in Marshall's case, perhaps an Anglo-sceptic. But Bulgarians obviously can do very little um, to stop the Americans, and they've done, you know, they've sort of expected this raid to happen um, as the tide of the war is turning against the Axis powers. Um, but the raid itself does little more than cause panic. The raids had initially begun in 1941 um, as a result of the Bulgarians signing the Tripartite Pact um, with the Axis powers. Um, and the Soviets, um, after the invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941 um, and later in, the, uh, in September 1942, did the Soviets uh, attack Bulgaria from the air bombing uh, the port of Varna, um, where German ships were docking full of drilling equipment that was going to be sent to the uh, Caucasus to um, repair newly captured uh, Soviet oil wells. Um, So the the Soviet raid there was actually of quite significant strategic importance, not just to the Soviet Union, but to the, uh, the whole Allied war effort. Tsar Boris III, the uh, sovereign of Bulgaria, didn't want his country to join the war. Germany put immense pressure um, on their former First World War ally, uh, and the Prime Minister Bogdan Filov um, was forced to declare war on Britain and America on the 13th of December 1941. Um, And the um, fear for the Bulgarians was, what if the Allies took them seriously. What if they actually became a serious target of of Allied bombing, knowing that they had very little in the way of air defences and couldn't do very much um, about it. But um, Bulgaria were um, not an armed combatant against the Allied powers, but a useful stop-off point for the Germans in the occupation of Greece and the defeat and destruction of Yugoslavia. Um, the um, the Bulgarian government learns pretty quickly that it has um, been forced to back the wrong side. In fairness, it could be argued that the Bulgarians have probably little choice in the matter, fearing facing 
probably German occupation if they had uh, been indecisive about um, any uh, in endorsement of the, of the Axis. So by 1943, um, it was clear to um, the British and the Americans that the Bulgarians were in a, an impossible situation, uh, that they would no doubt have Soviet armies on their territory within the next year or two, and that the, uh, the Nazis were utterly uncompromising. And this meant that the country was in a situation of crisis. This crisis could be amplified by bombing. Um, that bombing could be used as a political device um, that would force Bulgaria from the war. Um, this would bring a kind of a, a, a useful advantage against Nazi Germany, uh, possibly resulting in a neutral country, possibly even, as in the case of Italy, resulting in an, in an allied country and a foothold in Germany's southern flank. And there's some um, very typical language from Churchill uh, on, on his views of the Bulgarians, and he refers to them as a piquant people uh, to whom a sharp lesson should be administered. Um, this is not dissimilar to his views of the um, Arabs of Mesopotamia, when he was a colonial secretary in the 1920s and a, a minister for air during that same period. And he um, really looked upon these, in his view, lesser peoples as rather like kind of naughty children who needed to be punished and taught the lesson for the mistake that they had made. He went on to state that experience shows that the effect of bombing a country where there were antagonistic elements was not to unite those elements, but rather to increase the anger of, of the anti-war party. The uh, chiefs of staff in the United Kingdom were uh, unsure whether this was a good idea. The uh, result of bombing in Germany um, had been fairly minimal in terms of turning the civilian population against the Nazis. Uh, in fact, it had, as it, German bombing of Great Britain had, hardened civilian morale. So the, um, the view of the likes of Portal and the likes of Sir Alan Brooke was that this was pretty much a waste of time. In fact, perhaps the only figure that would have supported this policy and believed it was possible to win the war through air power alone uh, against civilian targets was Sir Arthur Bomber Harris. And it was unlikely that Harris would have been interested in diverting any aircraft from the main theatre of operations, which was, in his view, Germany. Both Britain and America went to the trouble of getting the permission of Stalin, uh, or the approval of Stalin, um, for the uh, attack. Um, and, of course, he's happy to do so. Bulgarians assumed that um, the first wave of um, bombing in 1943 was a response to the new anti-Semitic policies um, of Bulgaria. Bulgarians, to their credit, and if you read um, the book Stalin's Curse by Robert Galatoly, Bulgarians, to their credit, were uh, almost universally opposed to the deportation of Jews from their country. Uh, many Bulgarians hid Jews and... Other than Denmark, Bulgaria really stands out in Europe as one of the, the kind of the, the great bastions of Jewish uh, protection efforts uh, during the war. But the government, as Mussolini's government did, um, adopted the policies that were going to curry favour uh, with the Nazis. Again, there's, in Italy, there's very little real um, appetite for deportation of the Jews as nobody is in any doubt as to where they're going and what's going to happen to them. However, the, the bombing is nothing to do with the deportations. The, both Churchill and Roosevelt were careful not to associate uh, the war effort with the salvation of the Jews. Um, Tony Judd, in his book Thinking the 20th Century, uh, and uh, again in, uh, I think in post-war, uh, is really clear on this one. He says that there were sufficient numbers of anti-Semites in both Britain and America to um, make the, uh, the, the prosecution of the war far more difficult 
if it was believed that this was a, a war, a needless war against Germany in defence of the Jews who, according to you know, anti-Semitic mythology, had probably started the war in the first place using their mischievous and sinister techniques. So the, the raids in late 1943 are uh, you know, fairly, they achieve fairly little. 209 um, inhabitants of Sofia were killed um, and 247 buildings were damaged. Um, so the, the lesson itself isn't sort of harsh enough to change policy um, and didn't uh, encourage the Bulgarians to look to a, a, a political solution or a, a surrender. And so as a result, um, Churchill believes that in 1944 efforts must be redoubled and he wrote to Anthony Eden to, to make this point um, to say that now that the, the heaviest possible air attacks were being planned and that um, this might change the politics on the ground. So in January 1944, 108 B-17 Flying Fortresses were dispatched to Sofia. Um, again, poor visibility. Um, the Balkans are famed for this sort of thing. Um, meant that the attack was aborted. But on the 10th of January, 141 B-17s supported uh, by uh, that night by the RAF, who flew 44 Wellingtons, um, devastated Sofia. 750 people died, 710 were injured, and there was widespread damage across the city. Um, there'd been a power cut, ironically, at the time, so the air raids hadn't uh, sounded. And this uh, has a far greater effect, and it terrifies the civilian population, and 300,000 people leave the capital. Um, the government moves out of the capital as well, abandoning the, um, the government districts, and starts to um, spread itself out across the nearby towns and villages. And it took a fort, it takes a fortnight really to uh, restore the working of the the capital, um, and the but the the general population don't return. They assume that the, a, a similar attack is is going to occur, and the German ambassador tells um, Berlin that um, the psychological political situation in the country had changed completely and um, this meant that Bulgaria was in danger of um, defecting and the um, so it would appear that this this kind of brutal method was starting to yield results the extent how much the extent um, how much this is based around the bombing and how much this is based around the fact that the tide of war was clearly changing at this point anyway um, is, is debatable. The Bulgarians um, go via the Soviets first to ask for an end to the bombing. Uh, the Soviets give them a fairly short answer, abandon the Nazis and we'll talk about it and we'll think about it. Uh, and then they go through the Turks, who are, again, a regional antagonist for Bulgaria. Um, and whilst not in the war, they are looking to see what territory Bulgaria might be forced to give up at the end of the war. Both Churchill and Roosevelt were keen for the bombing to continue when um, the um, British um, diplomatic service in the Middle East wrote to Churchill saying it was probably better to suspend the campaign. He scrawled a note in the margin of the letter saying, why? Roosevelt also responded, if the medicine has done good, then let them have more of it. Um, which, again, gives you an insight into how these figures um, viewed um, nations, uh, perhaps outside their experience and knowledge, people that were um, perhaps viewed as being rather expendable. Um, it's a quite a kind of a high-handed colonial uh, way of thinking. But then again, you're talking about two, in essence, high-handed colonialists in one way or another. In March 1944, 367 uh, B-17s and B-24s attacked Sofia, um, carrying incendiaries um, in designed to create a firestorm. And the um, destruction of um, the city is huge. The civilian death toll is lower, but um, three and a half thousand buildings are destroyed. And finally, 
uh, on April um, the 17th, 1944, 350 American bombers attacked the uh, city, uh, destroying a variety of installations, um, particularly the rail marshalling yard. Um, so that uh, year, um, 1,165 Bulgarians were killed in Sofia. Um, and this obviously, you have to take into account the fact that there was an evacuation at the time. Um, so you can imagine the death toll had that not occurred. Um, and Bulgaria then ceases to be a key area of importance. We you know we're coming up to June 1944 and D Day, where all um, aircraft, all Allied aircraft, particularly bombers, are repri- reprioritized to the uh, attack on Normandy. And it's inevitable uh, following um, the launch. Um, of Operation Bagration, the massive uh, Soviet offensive in the east, that um, Bulgaria will simply become a uh, a Soviet-occupied state anyway. So the um, British and the Americans really drop the Bulgaria project. Um, Had they continued bombing, no doubt the pro-German government would have fallen, Um, but the policy um, cost of obviously 1,165 Bulgarian lives and arguably achieved very little. And it's this question that really occupies the thoughts of historians of aviation during the war. What, if anything, did bombing actually achieve? Did bombing achieve its political goals? Well, arguably not, in most cases. Did bombing achieve um, its military goals? Well, clearly... The, the kind of blitzkrieg aviation of dive bombers on the battlefield has an immense power, as was seen uh, in the fall of France. Um, but the long-range strategic bombing to wear down civilian industries, there's huge division over that. Albert Speer himself said that had the, uh, the raids in 1943 uh, continued for another six weeks, then Germany would have, have collapsed. Um, the the raids are gradually tailed off as the operation for Overlord is, is planned, but the the this evidence is kind of questionable because of the rapid um, recovery of Germany after the Second World War and the rapid rebuilding of industries, um, uh, which became kind of the foundations for the West German economic miracle. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this and found it useful. If you're teaching out there and you're enjoying your summer holidays, but you want some uh, excellent resources for the autumn, get on to my new newsletter. You can find it at www.outstandinghistory.com forward slash instant dash access. Okay. Anyway, I'll catch you on the next Explaining History podcast and see you soon. Bye-bye.